So today what we're um, primarily focusing on is um, trauma and how what we've discovered in our work with children who have experienced trauma. And um, we, it has made us think about uh, what it means for teachers. And, you know, there's so many times in a day that as, as someone who for many years has been in teacher education, has taught many teachers, um, as well as mental health specialists um, and family support people, uh, I've always, I've always, I thought that I was always in talking about very developmentally appropriate and, um, uh, and family-centered practices that I was giving teachers enough tools to go out and do the job, and do the job well. And um, as someone who has never been very settled uh, happily in one place or the other, I have found my whole career moving between academia and direct service, back to academia, back to direct service. I'm proud to say after now close to 30 years, I'm settling in direct service. And um, because the richness of what I experience on a daily basis um, is informing me in ways that, uh, that it can't if I'm sitting in an office someplace or reading a lot of research. And, uh, and so you're going to get a very sort of uh, a little bit of academics, but for the most part, a very practical view of the day-to-day -day work um, with children and families who have been facing a fair amount of hardship. Uh, and those are the families we serve, and we'll be going into the demographics of all of that soon. Before I begin on this, I do want to talk about the books that have been very generously <laughs> given. When they asked me for a list of books, I didn't think they were going to buy them all for you. Um, and uh, so depending, just so that you know, depending on where your interest is, um, the Unsmiling Faces book uh, is an actual curriculum, a social-emotional curriculum. So if you are interested in, in <coughs> curriculum specifically, I would say, please take that book. A Matter of Trust is also more of a practitioner's book. It, um, it really is about the role of um, attachment theory in the classroom. And attachment is a lot of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. And you know how to make a classroom how to make your environment one where children really, no matter what age the children are, feel like they have a secure base. And then the third one, creating schools that heal, this is for administrators, more policy makers, and I would say it kind of yokes together what's explored in Unsmiling Faces and um, Matter of Trust, uh, together in a broader sense and really talks about sort of what the whole program or what the whole school needs to consider. There's chapters for administrators. It's kind of, it's taking, it's taking these two concepts and, and for the, the more generalists to, to kind of have an idea. So I hope that helps um, since you've been told you can only take one of these books. Though it looks like some of you may be able to take more than one. Um, so first we want to begin with um, the effects of trauma and um, some of its implications for teacher practice. We'll also be coming back to that toward the end of the presentation. And then uh, uh, Claudia is going to kind of, um, she'll jump in um, because Claudia's stories what you'll learn about both Claudia and me is we're both storytellers, and, um, uh, and we have many stories to tell. But it's in our stories, it's in our teachers' narratives that um, I am able to pull out the implications for their, their teaching. 
as well as some of my direct experiences, but we're actually going to present kind of a case study, if you will, of, of one child um, who has um, experienced repeated trauma. And how old is he now? <laughs> no, he's, he's older than 11, oh, is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's 23 months. He's 23 months. So, and from, he came to us. He came to for four months. Four months. So this is a child who, from the time he came, has been experiencing repeated trauma. And um, so we're going to hear about his story. And then hopefully we won't go on so long that, there's, that there will be time for. Uh, and feel free to um, interrupt us at, uh, at any point. So I want to begin um, with the impact um, of trauma on brain development. The prenatal period through the first three years of life is, is critical in terms of brain development. And it lays the foundation for either a strong or fragile future, basically. And, um, and so we pay particular attention. I mean, for the most part, we pay a lot of attention to birth to five but very specifically, particular attention to the first three years of life. So the basics about brain development is that most of it occurs from the prenatal period to the third year. Brains develop from the bottom up. And you know, it's an interesting thing that I discovered um, in returning to direct practice is um, I have children who really lose it. I mean, completely. They, they're three years old, and they pick up chairs and tables and can throw them across the room. And you, you know that otherwise they would not have the strength unless they reached a very deep level of anger. And the way that I always think about it is they've gone back down to the brain stem. When they're in that place where they're capable of that kind of anger and strength and aggression, that they're there. So, and that's a very, that has important implications um, because in our very developmentally appropriate approaches to things, we try to talk to them. And it's important to know that they cannot hear us. And so this idea that the brain develops from the bottom, that also that bottom is always sitting there waiting to return to when the threat feels great enough. And uh, so I find that a very useful thing to, to keep in mind. The brain's capacity to change decreases over time. But I do want to say that it's, it's not, it doesn't mean that the brain is incapable of repair. And what we are learning more and more each day from neuroscience is that when a child, um, no matter how much they've, they've been through and no matter how much the brain has not developed, with the right relationship, there is always hope. There is always the possibility of change. And, um, and that's also important for us to keep in mind. And much of the brain's development depends on each individual's experience interacting with the environment. So obviously, our interactions, good and bad, are going to um, impact us. So, um, so here we have a picture of, um, of a healthy, uh, what a brain looks like in healthy development and what it looks like um, when there's toxic stress. So when children are exposed to attentive, nurturing, and growth-promoting interactions with invested adults, it leads to healthy development of the brain. And this includes a, think a thickening of the cortex, um, a development of more extensive and sophisticated neuron structures, and the creation of neurological foundations that support lifelong learning. Um, then, 
Unfortunately, on this side, we see the opposite. Um, you can see that the brain scan is uh, for children. Children are exposed to fewer colors, less touch, little interaction with adults, fewer sights and sounds, less language. Um, and, uh, and then, as a result, you have less of the neural connections. So it can be, it's pretty devastating what the potential is in terms of um, brain growth. And then if stress is chronic and long-term and severe, which is known as toxic stress, neurons can actually be severed. And current understanding of the research is that they can't be restored. However, the other thing that we do know is though those connections can't be restored, where there are connections, you can make connection. It, it's just coming in a different way. It's a little bit harder. It takes a little bit longer. But it's not destiny. So again, I, I just want to say, and I, I think I wouldn't be, Claudia and I wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't believe that. Um, that we could uh, make a difference in that way. Um, the traumatic experiences in early childhood, we often first think the most about direct abuse and neglect of the child. And certainly, this is, um, this is a horrible thing. And you know, we have children in our program um, who have, um, who have uh, traumatic brain syndrome because of shaken baby syndrome, uh, traumatic brain injury because of that. Um, we certainly deal uh, with, with different levels of abuse and neglect. But I have to say, I don't find that particular thing more or less than any other population that I have worked with. Where I find one of the biggest differences for the population we work with is the witnessing of violence in and outside of the home. And particularly since the recession, our area, um, there's been an escalation in the, the years since I've returned to the ounce. Um, the, I have never seen so much domestic violence as I am seeing now. And um, there's a very important thing about domestic violence that I, I just want everyone to keep in mind that makes it, in many ways, equally, if not more, um, detrimental to the child as abuse and neglect. And um, what happens with witnessing of violence is it has a deeper impact on children than people realize. Um, and with domestic violence in particular, this is because once someone who is usually the mother has been a victim of domestic violence, they're not the same person. And so what happens for the child is not only have they seen the person who really is in charge of protecting them the most. Not only have they seen the person who's in charge of protecting them in a weakened state, in a state where they can't be protected, but mom changes. And the mom I knew before this happened is no longer here. And so children are also grieving for the loss of the mother who was there before. And this has a very long-term impact. And it's one that a lot of people feel, especially people who are in these relationships, but I protected my child from getting hurt. And, and one of the things that we have to, as people who are working with the children as well as with the family, we have to know that there was a different kind of hurt that got inflicted on the child. And, um, and that it is one that is actually um, very long-lasting until we can bring you back to who you were, to who the child knew you to be. So, and that's why working, um, working in a system like Head Start, an early Head Start, is so wonderful because we, um, we have 
both teachers and family support services that we provide to our children and families. And so we can be working with the parents um, all along through this. And so it, it does speak to the importance of, of wraparound services, even for those who are in, in school systems, you know, what agencies are the schools linked to so such wraparound services uh, can happen. Um, our neighborhood, our children also see a lot of um, violence and there's a lot of um, disassociation from that violence. And so it's, um, and that's a whole other thing, you know, people die and uh, uh, not a lot is explained and um, uh, because it, it's become um, sort of an accepted part of life and, uh, you know, um, an accepted part of life and death. Separations and loss um, are much more traumatic than, uh, than people realize, you know, um, we're located, uh, Educare is located in the area where um, the Robert Taylor housing projects were housed for many years. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with them, but they were um, some of the largest housing projects. Uh, you know, the three large housing projects were Robert Taylor, Henry Horner, and Cabrini Green. And I think there were like 20,000 people at one point living in kind of a spread across um, uh, a six or seven block area. Uh, and those projects um, have come down, uh, but nothing has replaced them. And so the area that we serve is a very abandoned area. And many, we have families from the immediate area in um, three and four flat housing. It's all section eight. But then we have people who come from Englewood and other surrounding areas to us. But um, one of the things that was not realized um, was that when the housing came down, and I don't think anyone would disagree that um, public housing needed to come down, um, but it was people's homes and it was people's communities. And many of the people we serve are still in the surrounding area or have left for the so southern suburbs and have come back because this is what they know. Um, and now we're kind of seeing intergenerational sense of loss about place, about community, about a way of life. And uh, it affects people and it affects their ways of being with their children. And the way Section 8 works, at least on our end of the city, is that um, it's not always so permanent. And a lot of our families have to move a great deal. And, um, and so, uh, so that's, that's the idea of place. Is, is right now very tentative within our community. And, um, and then people come and go. You know, um, parents, uh, parents, some parents become couples and stay as couples. Some parents never become couples and, and the father or mother are in and out of the child's life. Um, incarceration, moving for jobs, there's a lot of moving for jobs. And uh, you know, we have a family who just moved back from uh, somewhere in the south suburbs. Um, the mom started her child back. They had been with us when the child was an infant. Now the child is three. They just came back because the mother got a job in Chicago. And because when her daughter started childcare, she got sick in those initial weeks. The mother lost her job, and now they have to move back because now they're homeless again because the mom can't pay the rent. So we have, um, we have a lot of that that goes on. And, uh, and all of this poses a major threat to a secure attachment relationship, and therefore it impacts um, healthy 
cognition and social emotional development. So, um, so these are, you know, when we sort of hope that children come in our classrooms ready to learn. Um, uh, some do, uh, many do, <clears throat> but some don't. And enough don't, you only need one or two children in a classroom, as many of you know, um, to take away from the learning of the rest of the class. And, um, uh, but we also further contribute to that when we don't understand what the source of their inability to attend, their inability to behave, um, or keep their emotions in check, we end up contributing to that too. Some of the behavior that we see is behavior that we commonly see um, for children who oftentimes are di diagnosed with ADHD, for example. Um, but one of the, one of the most, um, one of the key behaviors that we see that makes you, that has to t make you take pause and think it might be something else is this idea of hypervigilance. Um, we see children kind of very skittish. We see them wandering around the classroom. We see them <laughs> unable to focus on anything that's in front of them. But should there be a sound that comes from any place, they're jumpy. They're constantly scanning the room. They're constantly wondering, am I safe? And you can see that their minds are not on what you're talking about. They're not on what you're playing with with them. That there's, they're almost kind of, they're there, but they're not there. And, um, and it's because there's a preoccupation. Um, this little boy that uh, Claudia is going to talk about in a few minutes, um, yesterday she came, he had some unusual marks on his face, um, and she came in to um, show me the marks, and, um, and it, they, they were such that they caused me to raise my hand toward the child, and though I did it slowly, his flinch was so shocking um, that you know, it was, and there was, part of it was this hypervigilance and part of it was just a fear that my hand was coming at him um, in a manner that was not what I intended. And um, so we see that kind of behavior oftentimes for, for traumatized children. Um, you know, uh, an unusual sound can just send them flying. Um, our younger ones, uh, we tend to see being very clingy. Even in older children, they're the kind of kids in a classroom who will follow the teacher around. They're almost like a mosquito who just kind of won't, just won't give you a break, have to ask you, want to be kind of, uh, want to keep helping you. They, they just, there's a clinginess to them because they're scared. They're just scared. We see aggression, um, and we see many levels of aggression. Uh, and again, if we are not, like oftentimes teachers want like behavioral things, like I want to set up a sticker book, I want to do, you know, kind of these outside things. They don't think, let me pick you up and put you on my lap. Let me sit with you and, and read you. Um, a book and put my arm around you. Um, it all becomes about behavior management when in fact, and, and when I first started doing what we're doing now, you know, teachers would like be dragging this kid kicking and screaming and they would say, here, she'll spoil you um, because I would run over, pick them up and carry them into my office and sit down and talk to them and, and uh, and help them to, to get themselves back to regulation. We see that they tend to have a lot of hyperactivity, and they do look like they have ADHD. Um, 
We see tantruming. Um, I have five-year-olds in my program. Um, the level of tantruming is unbelievable. It is. It's picking up chairs, throwing them across the room, turning over tables, spitting, kicking, um, just unbelievable levels of tantruming um, that, you know, you just don't expect at that age. And then at the end of it, just being in an absolute pool of tears. I have never heard so much screaming at nap time as I have heard in the last few years, in their sleep. We see a lot of sleep disturbances, um, a lot of nightmares, uh, a lot of children who don't sleep, who stay up all night, and, uh, uh, and then come and desperately need to sleep. We see eating disorders of either no appetite or too much appetite, and. Um, and then, obviously, difficulty with self-regulation. Um, and when I'm, when I'm talking about um, self-regulation, I'm talking specifically uh, um, about emotional, attentional, and behavioral. So uh, I'm, t I'm taking all three with that. And, and it's very hard to distinguish between them. Usually, children are presented to me and our infant mental health specialists um, for behavior. But oftentimes what you see is their emotional expression is very different. And the other thing when you go to observe them in the classroom is that they have no ability to attend whatsoever for more than a very short amount of time. Are there any questions so far? Or? Okay, um, so I just want to briefly talk about Educare and who we serve. Um, I've told you a little bit about it, so excuse my repetition. I have a habit of getting ahead of myself. Um, our demographics is 99.5% African American children, most of whom live below the poverty line. Um, as I said, the area that we're in used to be surrounded by the Robert Taylor homes. In fact, this program it wasn't called Educare. It was called Help Me Joyce the, Chi the Center for, for <laughs> Successful Child Development. And we were, um, uh, we were connected to a famous Beethoven project. And, um, but uh, the ounce has been in this area for many, many years, and we were in the Robert Taylor homes my, my first time around when I, when I worked for the Ants, um, I think it's 17 years ago now. Um, and uh, so now all that property that surrounds us is vacant land. Our school, the Educare um, School, one side of us is the former DuSable High School, and the other side of us is Farron Elementary School. So we're sandwiched um, between two schools. But you know, with the charter movement in Chicago, I don't know what, who owns what of these schools and what their names are now. So I just go back to when I was first there. Um, Claudia just shared with me the other day when we were talking about um, uh, just the demographics, um, and I was talking about the loss of the housing projects and the loss of that community. Claudia told me that every year um, families come and have picnics on the grounds where the Robert Taylor homes were. They have reunions there. Um, so it is, um, it is a bigger loss than, uh, again, than I think people realize. And this is something that the children experience, too, as parents take them back there. You had I'm just a curious. So they took down those housing projects, but so where are those families? Where they just the families, many of them got deported uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the southern. Many sort of got sent out to southern suburbs to um, uh, uh, up to Peoria, down to Peoria. They, they were spread out and then slowly came back. Many went to Englewood um, uh, and the Kenwood, Oakland, area, and then, um, and because many of our families have a history with us from before, but they're not in the immediate area, so 
Um, it's Englewood who we serve, it's Kenwood, it's Hyde Park, and Chatham are the primary areas that people are coming from, and that many, um, it's uh, many generations uh, that we've been serving of those families. I, you know, some of our teachers are like, I had your mother, you know. So, um, uh, so our families are coming back. For a long time, they did go away. In the suburbs, for many, really was not the answer. And, you know, it was so much, you know, the best intentions. Uh, um, you know, everybody thought, you know, to go to the suburbs, you would be less isolated, but, you know, you, you've lived on public transportation and you don't drive and you're more isolated. And, and you know, isolation, who's defining isolation? And uh, so that, that's an important thing. Did you have a question, Barbara? I just wanted to, to go back a little bit to the trauma and the behavior. Uh -huh. And um, just kind of ask your, your advice, opinion, because these are things, like you said, teachers are seeing now. Usually it was the exception. Now it's more of the norm, um, because we have more in this stressful time, economics and demographics and stuff. <coughs> so our teachers really, I don't think are as prepared to deal with all these different behaviors. Then another piece you did say about the, the toxic stress, which severs some of the ties and there may be some things that they may be able to do. So now are we only left with intervention or is there something teachers really, you know, because right. that's a whole host of right. behaviors for teachers to be able to, yeah. it's so overwhelming. It is. So what Claudia and I are really going to talk about today is prevention. Okay. Because we can't, what happened, happened. Correct. What we can do is we can prevent our classrooms from contributing to it further. Correct. Okay. Correct. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm going with this. Okay. Um, so uh, if you would go back to the picture, I think it's important to point out how Educare is set up. So all of those little buildings are classrooms. Mm -hmm. And then in the center, um, so the front one is the front door. And then all of the little build, all of the little houses you see around it are classrooms. And so it was set up in a way that there's an inside playground for children to go out that will be safe from the community on the outside. So it's, in, it's enclosed. And um, I think it's really important and it kind of paints a picture about the area. So children were able to go outside because the buildings were surrounding the play area. And so sometimes we still have to use those areas because we've seen violence at the high school where they had the graduation and the shooting occurred. So, um, and the community would let you know when something was going on gang related. And so we were warned to make sure that the children stayed inside because something that the community did was protect the children. So I think it's important to understand how the building is set up. And even, because I, I was part of the ounce when we were designing um, Educare, that was actually the very first request because we had an increase in gang violence as the, as the homes were being taken down, gang turf was being taken away, and then the gangs moved into, so then you had gangs, rival gangs within the same buildings. So instead of shooting across the buildings, they were shooting inside the buildings. And so one of the things was when we were looking, um, knowing that the Robert Taylor homes were coming down to building this space was this idea of, because we weren't able to bring the children outside when I was there. And sometimes we'd get caught in crossfire and stuff. And so one of our first requests was not only to put a playground in the center, but to design the rooftops in a way that it would be hard for bullets to get through. So it was a way of deflecting. That was in some of the original discussions. I don't know if that's the final design, but I remember things were done at angles so that, um, so that it would have been, if there were another high rise going on across the street, um, uh, what we could do to protect the children. Um, so, when I came a uh, little over three years ago, and I returned to um, the ounce and to Educare, 
I think within the first couple of months of being there, um, there was this child, we'll call him Johnny, who um, I kept hearing about him. And I kept hearing his name being screamed down the hall. And sometimes when you would hear someone scream Johnny's name, it meant you better get up and get out in the hall because this kid has just bolted. And everyone was running. And you know, partly the, the, um, the effect of having the playground in the middle means Educare is a nightmare of a maze to find your way through, right? So the kids, you know, when they go, they're, they're going in a circle. So people are running from, from all directions. And, you know, if I was the one to catch Johnny, you know, whoever caught him would immediately um, get beaten up pretty, pretty fast, you know, until you could. And you, this was the first child, not the first child in my career that I would have to physically restrain. But this was, this was the first child that I encountered there that there was nothing else that you could do but restrain. And, and until he came down, and, and I, I learned from um, one of our mental health specialists then who has a strong neurological background, was the one who told me, you know, think of the brain stem. This is where he is. And so don't talk to him. Just hold him. And, um, and so, uh, uh, and Johnny's story was a very, very, very complex one. That Claudia had him as a baby and gave even more information to me. But I went into his classroom. And when I brought him back, and I had come as the zero to three curriculum specialist. Now I'm the zero to five curriculum specialist. So I didn't know the Head Start classrooms very well. And when I brought him back to his classroom, I immediately had to step back. It was so overstimulating that my first thought was, if I were in this classroom, I would bolt too. <laughs> and it got me, I then went around to all the classrooms. And it was early in my time at Educare. And, and the teachers weren't quite ready for me. And so I was taking my time going into classrooms. I was a new position. Um, I was, I was Dr. Abel, um, and I had to, and I was respectful. I, I, I wanted to build trust, or there wasn't a thing I could bring to them, no matter how much wisdom I thought I had um, to share, that anyone was going to hear. So I had pretty much stayed out of the rooms, but after getting beaten up a few times by Johnny, I said, I need to get into these classrooms. and. Um, and I just, I didn't go and observe for long, but the first thing I looked at was the classroom environments. And it's always, one thing I've learned about working with teachers, it is a good entry place to, when teachers don't want you in their rooms. If you talk about environment, you're much more welcomed. If you talk about children with problem behaviors and if you talk about environment, you have a better chance of getting into a teacher's classroom than if you talk about curriculum. Um, with them not realizing that all of that is curriculum. Um, so, uh, and one of the first things that I did was um, I started writing about just to process my own information and to have something to share with teachers. I I started writing both about behavior and I started writing about classroom environments just as a way of getting my thoughts together for what I would give them. And then the writing kept going. And the writing kept leading me to many of these books, that, it's all of these that are on your tables, um, and many other things. I found myself, because Johnny and Johnny's story I said, even what I know about good, sound, developmentally appropriate practice, 
that's not enough for helping a child like Johnny. And um, so I went to, in um, Skokie, uh, there is a place called the Virginia Frank um, Center. And it is a therapeutic nursery program. And I, um, I went, our, both of our infant mental health specialists came from Virginia Frank. I, I knew many people from Virginia Frank, but I hadn't been there in years. But I said, we need more therapeutic interventions, and I need to understand things about the environment that even I don't quite know yet um, that will help a child like Johnny. And so I went um, with some colleagues from Educare, and we went and observed. Um, fortunately, they have that um, the glass that you get to look through. Um, and we observed a bunch of sessions uh, with the children. And then I came back and I added to the environment. So, so here are, um, uh, this is one of the things to answer your question. Um, what we do know from neuroscience, um, and we certainly know since we've discovered things like sensory integration disorder, is that children are very easily overstimulated. And as much as teachers, you know, especially in pre-K classrooms, you know, and kindergarten classrooms and first grade, you know, they have their, um, they have their mnemonic devices that they put up so the children will be able to remember, th you know, you're working on this, so you have to have your alphabet line, you have to have your number line, you have to have this, you have to have that, you have to have it because the Itters and the Eckers tells you you have to have it. You know, you have all of these things that have to go on the walls. Um, and so what I said was, we will get there in time for the Itters and Eckers, but at the beginning of the school year, we need to take all the stimulation away. So, and I do believe it begins with how you start your school year. I think you can make changes in the middle of the year, but I think it begins with how you start your school year. And so we stripped down, we did quite a few, from the Virginia Frank Center, what I learned was nothing on the walls except family photographs, and family photographs are essential. They can be in children's lockers or cubbies, or in if you have the space on the on a, like in the reading area, so that children can look at them, talk about them. It's a language arts thing as well as a social emotional thing. Or if you have a loft space, to put them up in the loft, and um, only have a handful of manipulatives, puzzles. Don't. Don't put everything out. Go deeper with what you have. So have Legos, have Bristol blocks, and have Unifix cubes. That's all. Have X number of puzzles. That's all. Have writing. You don't need every art material out. Not yet. Simplify. Have them do one or two things. When they come into the room in the morning, have something sensory, have something that can be finished so that they have a sense of closure. It also invites the parent to do something that's not messy, that has an end point, have the parent read a book and then say goodbye, have the parent finish a puzzle, then say goodbye. Closure, a sense of you're going, but you will be coming back. And hellos and goodbyes were a very important part of that because many of our parents snuck out. Many of our teachers said, but they do say goodbye. And I'm like, but they say goodbye to you. But you, they don't say goodbye to a kid. They say goodbye to you. You two are so busy talking and whatever, and then they leave. But no one's stopping. You're holding the child, but Mom didn't say goodbye to the child. She said goodbye to you. And so, so emphasizing that, because separations and reunions, we know in attachment theory, tell us a lot. Separations and reunions are very important to any child. I know when you're going. I know when you'll be coming back. 
So the environment is, is, can do a lot. Now, and Claudia will talk a little bit more about that. The other thing I want to say for pre-K that is an intervention is at the beginning of the year to create what we call a planning board. And a planning board, and these are structures, and that was the, this is the interesting thing. Our program is far more structured now than I ever thought I would ever find myself making a program. But what we discovered was the children needed concrete structures. And so um, the, this planning board is a, it's pictures of every area of the room. And then under that, you have little pieces of Velcro for how many children can go into that area. And then on the side, you have every child's picture at the beginning of the year, and you eventually change it to their name. Um, and they have to go to the board with the teacher and make a plan. So they don't only plan what area they're going into, but they have to decide what they're going to do in the area. And so, and they also see if they want to go to blocks and there's three names in blocks and that's all the room that there is, that they can't do that right now. So then you introduce a negotiation. And, and so they, they'll have to go to, some, to one of the kids and say, when you're done, could you let me know so I could come into the block area. A lot of times we have teachers, you have these kinds of things in classrooms where children, like at that area, the child puts their, their name over there, that, the place where they've chosen. The planning board is a very different thing, and it requires much more. It requires that a teacher be there, that the child make the decision where they're going to go and what they're going to do, that the teacher knows what they're going to do, and where they're going to go so that the teacher can follow up with that. And so you get them. It puts the teacher in a very knowledgeable position and one to follow up with the children to serve as a kind of a secure base in saying, I heard you. I know what you're doing. I'm, I'm looking forward to, I, I'm coming to see what you're doing because you made me very excited about what you're doing. It's something very simple takes minutes, uh, seconds, right? You have a question? You're talking about just general recommend recommendations for every preschool classroom. That, that knowing that you might have one child who has experienced trauma. Can we assume that? Can we assume that we're going to have one child? You know, the fact <laughs> is, the fact <laughs> is, you can, ass I think there's not, a t in all my years of teaching, and I taught many years, and I will say this both at the infancy level and at the graduate school level, you always have a student or two who needs something more. So even if it's not trauma, even if it is hyperactivity or it is sensory integration disorder or their temperament is just crazy-making, uh, to them and to you, right? Well, as a preschool teacher, it's my thought that something's going on with the child, so I need to figure out what it is that's going on with the child, and uh, then, you know, talk to the parent and maybe get a referral out. But, my, so my question, I, or my comment is that um, I want to help my, my, um, my students understand that you're going to have a combination of behaviors. Some of it could be because of trauma, but you don't necessarily have to know what kind of trauma it is to be able to deal with it in the classroom. You don't. Right. Okay. Yeah. You, and, because and so. Because they get so fascinated about, you know, we get fascinated about why the child is acting yeah. that way and the psychology behind it. Yeah. And I want them to understand that if you're setting up your environment, in this way is going to help with the child who has either experienced trauma or has ADHD or tends to just you know run at a higher pace than everybody does, that sort of thing. Yeah. So yes, that's what you're saying. These are good sound preventative yeah. practices. Yeah. Okay. 
that, very yeah, yeah. And um, because when it, you know, my mantra on my desk, I have this little piece of paper from when I started this and I was talking to one of the mental health specialists. She just kept saying to me, make a plan. And when we can do that with children, we get them settled, we get them regulated, and it's the best form of prevention is to help them make a plan. So the traumatized child who's hypervigilant, who's roaming around the classroom, um, who can't get focus, if he makes a plan, he has a better chance of executing something, seeing it through to an end, than he would if he hadn't. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. So very typically, students will say, um, as we're talking, like if we're doing our section on trauma, you know, in childhood, and then we will talk about a specific, you know, so I go through the list of these are things that you can see in children um, who might have experienced trauma. Um, so then they go the next step and they say, oh, well, because Billy's hyperactive, he must have experienced trauma, right? But that's not necessarily true or... Right, it's right. not. Right. And so, you know, it can come from many places. The fact is, the interventions are the same in many ways. There are, we have particular books, for example, my favorite book in the world, and I have, I've had children steal it from the center. Um, and different books work for different children, but specifically um, for children who have seen things. Not so much children who have directly experienced, but have seen things. A book that's called A Terrible Thing Happened. And you don't know what happened to the little creature in the book. But what it sort of says is when I started putting words to it, it got better, basically. And so, and then you see children really talk in metaphor. And um, because they can't, especially when they have seen things they can't make sense of, they can't talk directly about what happened. But they'll come to you and they'll say, I need that book again. And we do have children who, you know, they'll turn over a chair and you go over to them and they say, I need the book. And it's like, so the next time, can you ask for the book before we have to turn over a chair? I mean, you, you know, but it's, um, and kids have stuffed them. I found them stuffed in backpacks and stuff in the classrooms. Um, so children, if you have a good group of books like Are You My Mother? I call it the Stephen King novel of early childhood. Um, because it really is. You know, it's every child's worst fear, I, you know. Um, but children really need to recreate that, and it empowers them um, over, you know, it gives them a sense of power over um, the loss of mother. And, um, Can I ask one more sure. Kids that, sorry, this is the last time. Kids that are turning over chairs, like very aggressive, like that, um, do you always assume that that's coming from uh, the brain stem? Do you, do you I believe when they reach that point. Do kids ever truly just do that sort of thing to get attention? No. Okay. I do not believe that they do. Well, yes, they're doing it to get attention because they have a need for attention. Right, yeah. I, I see it. I see, I see when they've, by the time they've turned over the chair, we have missed so many cues that... Um, Which perhaps have an opportunity. That what? Perhaps have to be very close Yes. Sometimes you don't get a lot of Yeah, no, you don't. But, um, but by the time the chairs are, I would say, more so throwing them. Because I watched a child just last week for attention, went around the classroom, and I, I, was, I was filming as a coaching thing, and I'm stand, I myself, I'm filming, and I'm like, I wish a teacher would notice this child. And I'm watching this child just very carefully go around the table and do the and look to see if anyone was looking. Um, and then, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. And then one goes down a little bit quicker. And then another child came running over 
to join her, and then she burst into tears. And so what's the, what's the immediate intervention the teacher should do? I think that... Um, so the teacher didn't catch it. It happened. So... And then the teachers didn't know what happened, so they came over, and I had to intervene because they were like, look what you've done, you know, and yada, yada, yada. So you don't know. I, so one of the things um, that we've done with New Beginnings, one of the first things um, that one does is we recognize that behavior is communication. And you can try to guess at an emotion. And part of it is looking at to see where the child is. And to give a name to the emotion in the moment. So it looks like you must be pretty angry. So I'm here to help you. It looks like you might be, I mean, certain children, you would know a pattern and say, I know you're missing mommy and that makes you very sad. Or I know, but put an emotion to it before you talk about the behavior. Because the behavior is communicating the kid doesn't feel well right now. And if you need to start with that, and it's not cutting them a break, it's not giving them any slack, but it is saying, I recognize that you are trying to tell me something very important. And I am going to help you. We're going to work together to figure this out and to help you feel better. And usually, when you've done that, Without you saying a word, one of the first things they'll do is go over and clean up the mess they made. Because you, you, you acknowledge them, you met them where they were. And that's a very hard thing for teachers to learn, is to begin with emotion. But 99% of the time, it works. Now, if we go up to them and we see the chairs turned over, and we're scared, and we're angry, and we say, I know you're angry. Yeah. It's not going to work. So we have to collect ourselves and just sort of say, you must be pretty upset to have turned over all of those chairs. Come here. Let's figure out what's going on. And um, I don't care if they're 18 months old with very little language or they're five years old with a lot of language, in that moment, they have no language. In that moment, they have no access. They do have access to feelings. Uh, they can't identify them, but they know when you have embraced them rather than scolded them, that they can pull themselves together. So that's... <coughs> See, Claudia, I told you, there'd be so many questions. Are we, like, out of time? Oh, no. I, wanna, I want Claudia to talk. Um, the whole goal was that she would do most of the talking today. So I'd like her to, um, to tell you uh, very specifically about one child in interventions and the work that she's done. So I'll go uh, fairly quickly. But um, when this was introduced to us, um, after being in it 20 years, I was like, whatever. I'm not taking everything off the wall. You know, I was we really resist, um, resisted it. I, I pretty much I had the children for two years. I had figured, figured the children out. But I know that I was putting out a lot of fires. And in the past, you would have one or two children who had some trauma. But I noticed that out of eight, I had about four. Today, I have five out of eight who are experiencing some type of trauma in the home. Um, so it re it's really been very helpful for me because after trying it the first year, the kids came to school and I didn't recognize them. And I'd had them for two years. I'm like, who is this kid that's doing, you know? But I realized that have uh, taken all the simulation away, um, being present, only having a few items of materials out and introducing the children to the materials and engaging with them, it made a difference in the classroom. So I wanted to share a story about Joseph. So when Joseph came to us, he was four months old. Within the first month of being there, his aunt was murdered in the home. Um, within the next week, his dad and uncle was arrested in his house. 
Um, right after that, the dad beat the mother up. Um, this was all within, by the time he was six months, um, his dad had tried to blow their car up with the family in the car. Um, dad went to jail. We just saw this child go, his affect go from being up and bubbly to none. He was just, so um, now um, he, come, he would come to school, he was very aggressive, um, wandering. You didn't know if he was up or he was down. But in talking to Barbara, she always challenges, <laughs> always challenging me. She said, okay, so we know this, but what are we going to do to help him here at school? So we began to think about what were we going to do for each child. And we had to stop thinking. I used to think, oh, let me get the math experience. Let me get the science experience. Let me, you know, I was thinking um, more academics. I started thinking about the children and what they needed out of the experience that we were having. And it really made a difference for Joseph. So instead of at the sand table, us just filling and dumping, I started thinking about what materials was I going to put in the sand table to help him deal with the loss of dad being in jail, to help him deal with the loss of mom going to work. He was missing them and he couldn't say this to me. So in the sand table, I will put um, small items that he would have to find. So we would bury them together and then he would have to find them. And it made the experience different. So now he's able to count the animals. Now he's able to separate them and sort them. But I couldn't help him get to that until I dealed with the fact that he was, he was experiencing loss. Um, something else that we did to help him in thinking about him is that in the morning when he comes in, we know that he's not getting a lot of sleep. He's made that very real for us, that he's very tired. Um, so when he comes in, we have a spot for him to lay down. But before we do that, we read a book called Choco's Mother. And it's a little bird who's wandering around asking all kinds of animals, um, are you my mother? And he's, he can't identify with anybody because all the other animals are looking at attributes. Oh, my cheeks are fat. Your cheeks are fat. My cheeks aren't fat. You're blue. You're yellow. And so Choco then comes to a bear, and then the bear asks him if I was your mother. If your mother was here, what would she do? That's what Choco, uh, the bear says. If your mom was here, what would she do? So every day I ask Joseph, I read the book and I say, if your mother was here, what would she do? And every day it's the same thing. He turns around, he straddles me, and I rock him to sleep. But every day he goes and gets the book and he brings it to me for me to read it to him. But he's telling me, he, he wants me to ask him, if your mother was here, what would she do? So um, it's simple things like that. It's, it's knowing that every transition is a loss. Leaving one activity to go to another activity is a loss. You're leaving all your materials. You're leaving a certain area. So it's like the way um, New Beginnings has challenged me to think about everything that I do and how it supports each child in the classroom. So um, I know we didn't have a lot of times. So I kind of cut it short, but does anybody have any questions? Uh, how old is how old is he? Now. He's 22 months now. 20 yeah, 23. He's 23 months. He'll be 20. He'll be two next month. I was going to ask about in terms of the preventive preventative strategies. We were wondering. So one, you had said you know not so much on the walls and introduce things slowly. And what I wondered is, you know, a lot of times you see that daily schedule and it's the same on the first day of school as it is on the last. And is that something too where? It could be in the beginning of the school year that they don't, an hour and 20 minutes of open free play is too much for children well, see, to control themselves or to expect them to control. Or in the beginning of the year, three people in the house is max. But by the end of the year, when more self-regulation and maturity comes, five people get along in the house. It actually can make it more interesting and dynamic. Or in the beginning of the year, maybe we need three stops in carpet time for eight minutes, just to bring it down again. First, the idea that we met at the carpet once, now it's free play for an hour and a half. And we're gonna meet and I'm gonna say goodbye. So I feel like the daily schedule is something else that maybe I'm hearing could be adjusted. You're giving a nap time to someone when they get there versus at the schedule of nap time. Right. And, that, and that's very much the case. It's the beginning of the year, and that's where New Beginnings got its name, was the beginning of the year, the first 45 days are a much more structured, much more prescriptive time of the year, including 
And this is a very straight, this one I really had to wrap my head around, and this is for pre-K. I had ditto sheets for coloring, from coloring books, only in the first 45 days. And the reason for this is that it, um, children need containment. They need, until they are comfortable, they kind of need to fit things into boxes. And what this does for a child who's all over the place is it helps them to focus. And, and so, and they have to disappear after the first 45 days unless a particular child needs to keep coming back to them. But it's that kind, it's a preventative thing that, that really there's something very soothing about coloring inside the lines. And, um, but that kind of stuff, and you do, you gradually add more and more. You gradually add more people to an area. And then, you know, we do, like in pre-K, we do very deep studies. And, um, but the studies get introduced for after the first 45 days. So the first 45 days is focused on teacher-child interactions. Child-child interactions, parent teacher interactions. And we believe that so much learning comes from that when done well, that um, you're setting a foundation. And you're making some of those neuro connections that the children might not necessarily have come in with. So yes, the daily schedule, but also using it, because we put it up, and then most of us barely refer to it and um, making it useful. And then another intervention or preventative thing is for your children who struggle from getting to point A to point B to the most, is they have their own personal daily schedule that's like on a little flip chart that they carry around with them so that, and then when they flip it, you make a plan right then and there with them. When we go to, you know, we're getting ready to go to the gym, where are you going to stand in the line? What are you going to do when we get there? So that you can individually still kind of monitor what's coming, and they know what's coming, and it becomes like a Bible to them. You know, they hold on to that. Barbara, thank you very much. For those are the questions, you can stay. I do want to announce that there are enough books, so I think everyone can have one copy. The main goal is to make sure that every center has of those of you attending, every center has a, a set of three, but I think there are enough um, for every, one for each person. May I ask you a quick question? Um, just because you said you changed um, from the way you used it, do you find yourself now personally more relaxed, yes. more in the moment, more able to comprehend instead of coming from an emotional, why is it keep doing this? You're more. I, I really think about what I bring to the interaction. I think more about what I bring to the interaction. There's a lot more planning going on. There's a lot more planning going on between my team and I about what the materials are saying and what the environment is saying to the child. So we look at how everything is implementing, how everything is working together or not working together and what we can do to change it. And with the schedule, we're, um, the schedule fluctuates between, so we're having a big group and there's a child who can't work in a big group, we do a lot of small groups too. And we may take that child out of the room. So we do try to plan for individual children because it's important every child needs something different. And the reason I ask that, and I really, because I do lots of training for CPS, I do lots of training, um, because teachers are nervous, especially in the first day, they have to have everything. And I agree with you, it's so overwhelming, even to me, I, I want to run out of the room. And so getting them to, to tone it down, I just want to personal thing Because they're too nervous, I think it comes from a philosophy that you have. Because they're like, no, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't have all this stuff that the director's going to do. But to be able to articulate what's going to come out of it, doing it in increments in a different way, I think is so powerful. And I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't know if I was nervous. I just felt like it was what it was supposed to be. That's the way it was supposed to be. And, um, and I think that we, we, if you don't know, you just don't know. But if you give it a try 
and see and see what the outcomes are. And I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that I gave it an opportunity because the outcomes were much greater for the children that were in the classroom. Uh, thank you. Yeah.